I, good evening, everybody. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay, good, all right. Um, so I'm talking about baptism and confirmation. Uh, so these, the reason why these sacraments are presented together is because they're connected. Um, and I'll go in, in, into that later in the talk, why they're connected. So what, what distinguishes these two sacraments, one of the things that distinguish them is that they're two of the three sacraments of Christian initiation. And the third one is the Holy Eucharist. And so you may be going, well, what's a sacrament of Christian initiation? And, and so we have RCIA, which is the rite of Christian initiation of adults. So this is from the catechism. The sacraments of Christian initiation, baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist lay the foundation of every Christian life. So these are foundational sacraments. The sharing in the divine nature given to men through the grace of Christ bears a certain likeness to the origin, development, and nourishing of natural life. The faithful are born anew by baptism, strengthened by the sacrament of confirmation, and receive in the Eucharist the food of eternal life. By means of these sacraments of Christian initiation, they thus receive in increasing measure the treasures of the divine life and the, I can't read that last word, advance toward the perfection of charity. So I'm going to, this is like, there's a lot packed in this paragraph and the presentation is going to go through this and explain what all this means. And you do, you did all get handouts uh, in the email from Rick and Bobby. So there's an outline, maybe if you've already looked at it, you know this, I always like to provide an outline of notes that what I talk about with scripture references, catechism references, so you can go back and look at it. There's also some other handouts for you on um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, because I'm not going to be able to go into detail on that with this talk. So you need to read those to learn more about the gifts of the Holy Spirit that I'm going to be talking about just in like a really uh, a sketch outline form. And then there's another one about the sacramental oils that are used. There's three kinds that are used in the sacraments. Um, and then there's another one that's called the sacraments in scripture. That was just sort of an extra. If, you've, if you're over, already overwhelmed with reading, don't worry about that one. But that's just more where you can find the different uh, sacraments in scripture. Uh, they're not always in there by name, uh, like confirmation. The name's not in there, but the sacraments in there. Um, so baptism and confirmation are also distinguished along with the sacrament of holy orders from other sacraments in that they leave an indelible mark. So that means a mark that can't be removed. It's permanent, which is why they cannot be re repeated. So that's why once you're confirmed, you can't be confirmed again. Once you're baptized, you cannot be baptized again. And, and now the church will baptize people that have had a type of baptism, but there's, it has to be done the right way, which I'll get into more detail later. But if you're, if you don't have a valid baptism, you've got to get baptized. And so the church never rebaptizes validly baptized people. It will only baptize if there's a question that the person was validly baptized, or it's not known for sure if they were baptized. And then in that case, it's called conditional baptism. So the wording is a little different uh, because again, you, you can't receive the sacrament again. It's a one-time thing. Uh, I don't know if this was covered in a previous lesson. So I'm throwing it out there just in case it wasn't. What is a sacrament? So the sacraments are efficacious. That means they do something. They're efficacious signs of grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us. So these are the ways that the light, the grace of Christ is given to us. The visible rites by which these sacraments are celebrated signify and make present the graces proper to each sacrament. They bear fruit in those who receive them with the required dispositions. And this is an important point because I've talked to Catholics, well, really not, not practicing anymore Catholics or ex-Catholics, 
you know, he said, well, you know, I grew up Catholic. I received the Eucharist. I got baptized, confirmed. It didn't do anything for me. Well, they're not magic. So you have to receive these sacraments with the proper disposition. If you don't have if you don't have a proper disposition, it, they're not going to bear fruit in you. So you'll receive the grace. It just won't bear fruit in you if you're not open to the grace you're receiving. Oh, sorry. And it says sacraments are powers that come forth from the body of Christ, which is ever living and life giving. They are actions of the Holy Spirit at work in his body, the church. They are the master works of God in the new and everlasting covenant. And there, I found this picture, it's on the screen here, which I think is a good visual representation um, of what the, the role of the sacraments, because you see Jesus here at the top on the cross, and this is, he, he purchased this grace for us through his passion and death, and it's because of his passion and death that these sacraments apply the grace one for us on Calvary because Jesus died for everyone. Everyone has the possibility of being saved. God desires all men be saved. But in order to be saved, you have to believe in Jesus. You have to receive these sacraments to receive his life with the first one being baptism. So we're not automatically saved because Jesus died for us. That salvation he won for us has to be applied and the sacraments are the way that happens um, baptism i'm going to talk about that one first because it's the foundational it's the doorway to all the other sacraments so baptism is prefigured in the old testament and and we see this with a lot of things in the old testament that we get like a preview of them that in their fulfillment in the New Testament. And St. Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all of them were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And then the, the uh, early church father Origen said that which the Jews considered to be the crossing of the sea St. Paul calls baptism. That, with, that which they believe to be a cloud proves to be the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about these are prefiguring of the actual sacrament of baptism. Well, let me go back to the other one. So let me give you an example of this. This is from St. John Chrysostom, one of his homilies he gave. And this is, uh, he's talking about this uh, typology, this prefiguring in the Old Testament, that fulfillment in baptism. And he explains, he says, you did not see Pharaoh drowned with his armies, but you have seen the devil with his weapons overcome by the waters of baptism. The Israelites passed through the sea. You have passed from death to life. They were delivered from the Egyptians you have been delivered from the powers of darkness. The Israelites were freed from slavery to a pagan people. You have been freed from the much greater slavery to sin. Do you need another argument to show that the gifts you have received are greater than theirs? The Israelites could not look on the face of Moses in glory, though he was their fellow servant and kinsman. But you have seen the face of Christ in his glory. Paul cried out, we see the glory of the Lord with faces unveiled. Christ is the new Moses. In those days, Christ was present to the Israelites as he followed them, but he is present to us in a much deeper sense. The Lord was with them because of the favor he showed Moses. Now he is with us, not simply because of your obedience. After Egypt, they dwelt in desert places. After your departure, you will dwell in heaven. Their great leader and commander was Moses. We have a new Moses. God himself is our leader and commander. What distinguished the first Moses? Moses, scripture tells us, was more gentle than all who dwelt upon the earth. We can rightly say the same of the new Moses, for there was with him the very spirit of gentleness, united to him in his inmost being. In those days, Moses raised his hands to heaven, and brought down manna, the bread of angels. The new Moses raises his hands to heaven and gives us the food of eternal life. 
Moses struck the rock and brought forth streams of water. Christ touches his table, strikes the spiritual rock of the new covenant, and draws forth the living water of the spirit. This rock is like a fountain in the midst of Christ's table, so that on all sides the flocks may draw near to his, this living spring and refresh themselves in the waters of salvation. Since this fountain, this source of life, this table surrounds us with untold blessings and fills us with the gifts of the Spirit, let us approach it with sincerity of heart and purity of conscience to receive grace and mercy in our time of need. Grace and mercy be yours from the only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's a, I, I love that, that homily that's putting together the Old and the New Testament and how now what we're experiencing in these sacraments is real spiritual salvation. It's not symbolic. I came, I was an evangelical Protestant for 20 years. First, I was Reformed Baptist, then I was Presbyterian. In both those churches, baptism was strictly a symbol. It didn't do anything. We believe that it symbolized something God had already done in us through the Holy Spirit rather than actually giving us grace and, and justifying us. So this is the power of the sacraments. They have the power to save us, to give us grace. Um, another one which is up here is uh, Noah. This is from First Peter. Peter says, God patiently waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few persons, eight in all, were saved through water. This prefigured baptism, which saves you now, it is not a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then the prophet Ezekiel gives us uh, a prophecy of, of the future sacrament. He says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities and from, from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you, taking from your bodies your stony hearts and giving you natural hearts. I will put my spirit within you and make you live by my statutes, careful to observe my decrees. And that's exactly what happens in baptism. We're cleansed of all of our original sin, actual sin. We're literally giving a new spirit, the grace of God within us. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us and we are made capable of obeying the commandments of God. So the origin of all the sacraments is they come forth from the side of Christ, from the flow of water and blood from the side of Jesus. The flow of the water symbolizes baptism and the blood that flowed from his side symbolizes the Eucharist. And this is from the catechism. The origin and growth of the church are symbolized by the blood and water which flowed from the open side of the crucified Jesus. For it was from the side of Christ as he slept the sleep of death upon the cross that there came forth the wondrous sacrament of the whole church. So this was another fulfillment of an Old Testament prefiguring because remember in the story of Adam and Eve, before God you know, Adam was created first and not Eve initially, and then God caused a sleep to fall upon Adam, and God took a rib from the side of Adam and created Eve. So Jesus is the new Adam, and so on his death, when the, the, the uh, spear pierced his side, that blood and water that flowed forth gave birth to his bride, the church. So again, this was an Old Testament prefiguring of a reality, a New Testament reality. Now, the early church fathers taught that at Jesus's baptism, Jesus sanctified water to be a vehicle of his Holy Spirit. And this is from St. Gregory of Nazianzus. He said, Christ was baptized in order to sanctify the Jordan for our sake and in readiness for us. Jesus didn't need to be baptized. He submitted to bapti be baptized out of obedience. There's another dimension to his baptism that I'll go into later. But uh, he part of the reason for his baptism was to sanctify all water to be used as a vehicle for his Holy Spirit. So sacraments, all sacraments are signs and they point to something other than themselves. So God uses natural symbols 
that are elevated by God to point to a deeper spiritual reality. Water, oil, perfume, bread, wine, these are all physical things that are used in sacraments. And I know Deacon Bill has mentioned this before, how grace builds on nature. It doesn't obliterate. God doesn't obliterate nature. When he saves us, he builds on it. And so he takes these natural things and he adds a supernatural reality to them through his grace. So the sacramental sign is applied to the body. So in baptism, it's water. In confirmation, it's oil. Uh, in the Eucharist, it's bread and wine. Uh, perfume is added to one of the sacramental oils that's used in confirmation. So the sacramental sign is applied to the body, but acts in the soul, putting the body in service to the soul. And that's why we have sacraments, because we are a unity of body and spirit. Angels are pure spirits, and but we aren't angels. We are not pure spirits. So God gives us grace, which is for our soul through physical means, because we're also physical beings. And so this is from Tertullian, who was an early church father. The flesh is washed so the soul may be purified. The flesh is anointed so the soul may be consecrated. The sign of the cross marks the flesh so the soul may be, may be strengthened. The imposition of hands overshadows the flesh so the mind may be enlightened by the Holy Spirit. So, and he lived in like the third century. So this is going back to the very early, early times of the church. Now, form is the other uh, dimension of a sacrament. So these are the words. First is the sign, which is the physical matter. What matter is used for the sacrament? Form are the words used to bring about the sacrament. Because if you just splash water on somebody and you don't have the words of baptism, they're not going to be baptized. So the form has to, these are the words have to accompany the, the physical matter. So what's the significance of words? Well, words are connected to the word because remember in John's gospel, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the word made flesh. And so words are connected to action, which is also a sign. So word and action come together. So when you're baptized, the priest or deacon will pour water on you. But if that's all they did, well, what does that mean? So those words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, consecrate the action of pouring water, opens up the meaning of the action, and makes the sign and the action of prayer. And the same thing with confirmation, the bishop or the priest will put, you know, press the oil upon the forehead uh, with their thumb. And again, they say a prayer when they say that, and that makes it a sacrament. It comes together to bring you the grace uh, of that sacrament. So in the case of baptism, the sign is water, and you can only use water. You can't use Kool-Aid or milk or orange juice, it has to be water. And water is universally a symbol of cleansing, of purification. Uh, it's also symbolic of life and death because without water, there's no life. And then water can also kill the flood in the Old Testament, you know, that destroyed the life on earth. Now, the form of the sacrament of baptism is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So this is a Trinitarian formula. And so that's why baptisms that are performed by groups that don't believe in the Holy Trinity, like Mormons, Oneness Pentecostals, probably other groups, I can't name them off the top of my head, their baptisms are not valid because they do not baptize uh, in the name with the belief in the Holy Trinity. So their baptisms are not valid. Um, another aspect with both baptism and confirmation is the notion of a seal. And that was mentioned in the scripture uh, reading earlier. So in the Old Testament, slaves were branded to show that they belonged to somebody. And circumcision, which was the way of entering into covenant relationship with God, uh, you know, Abraham was circumcised. Moses 
commanded circumcision. You ha a, a male had to be circumcised to be in that covenant family of God. That's permanent. You know, once that's done, you can't erase that. And circumcision is a prefiguring of baptism. And Roman soldiers were also marked, I believe they were tattooed when they joined the army. So there was a notion of that some kind of mark or, or something done to show like a belonging, a permanent belonging. And the book of Revelation says, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And this is how we're sealed is through baptism and confirmation. So as I mentioned before, baptism is the door to the other sacraments. We cannot receive the other sacraments until we've been baptized, because until we have been regenerated, until we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we cannot receive the grace of the other sacraments because we don't belong to God yet. So what does baptism do? Well, Jesus says this, amen, amen, I say to you, you cannot enter the kingdom of God without being born of water in the spirit. This is the means, the normative means of entering the kingdom of God. Um, so what does baptism do? It causes us to enter the Paschal mystery. The Paschal mystery is the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, which is what we're celebrating at every Mass. Every Mass, we're celebrating the Paschal mystery in a sacramental way. Um, and there's a, in one of the handouts you have in your email, there's a link to two videos. One of them I'm gonna show you tonight. The other one is longer, which is why I'm not showing it, but it explains this in more detail. So I encourage you to watch that. It's by Dr. Brant Petrie and he's very good at explaining these things. It's, and I, I highly recommend you watch it. It's only about 12 minutes long. Baptism cleanses us from sin both original and personal. Now, original sin is not a sin that we commit. It is a, it's really a state of being because Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they lost sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is grace that makes us holy. It, 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 it's what unites us to God in relationship. And they lost that. So when they lost that, they couldn't pass that on to their descendants. So the whole human race, with the exception of the Blessed Mother, has been born in this state, deprived of sanctifying grace. Baptism restores sanctifying grace. And if we get baptized, which you catechumens will be getting baptized as adults, so you're going to have personal sins you've committed up to, this, up to the point you're baptized, baptism will wash all that away. So if you were to die, like right after you got baptized, you would go straight to heaven because not only does baptism remove the guilt of sin, all sin you've committed up to that point, but it also removes temporal punishment due to sin. And so that sin, I mean, that's punishment that we suffer in the here and now or in purgatory in order. Uh, it's, it's sort of like I use the analogy of like uh, it, it's uh, like disciplining, like in the book of Hebrews, we've been going through the book of Hebrews during mass. And I think the, one of the most recent readings was that God chastises those he loves. And so when we sin and we repent, God forgives us, but there still may be temporal punishment. And the purpose of that temporal punishment is to teach us, you know, not just like we we discipline our children when they do wrong because we're trying to teach them to do what's right, to, to teach them to be better people. Same thing with temporal punishment. Baptism also incorporates us into the church, which is the mystical body of Christ. So without baptism, we're not joined to the church, which is the body of Christ. So once we're baptized, we become members of the church. And this includes non-Catholic Christians. If they're validly baptized, they are joined to the church, not in a perfect communion because they don't uh, share all the same beliefs and they don't have the sacrament of confirmation or Eucharist, but there is, a, there is they are joined to us. And that's why we call Protestant separated brethren. They're, they are Christian. They're members of the body of Christ. They're just not in full communion. And that's why when 
Protestants become Catholic, it's referred to as entering full communion, not entering the church. They're just entering full communion. They've already joined to a degree. Uh, there's a, a level of union there, but now it's perfected. We're justified, and that means we're put into a right relationship with God. We're made righteous by the infusion of sanctifying grace and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so that's why this is the foundational sacrament, is this is the sacrament that justifies us. Now, one question that comes up is, well, what about people who don't, they can't get baptized? You know, they don't live where there's any Christians, but, uh, or I mean, maybe not a Catholic church where there's a priest or a deacon, but they come to believe in Jesus, but there's nobody to baptize them. Are they going to go to hell? No, because the church has always taught that that there is a baptism of desire, and this is this was goes back to the early church because the cat the the instruction the RCA back then they didn't call it that, but the RCIA in the early church was three years long, and so this was the time of persecution. A lot of catechumens did not live to be baptized, and so it was considered that they had a baptism of blood, that somebody, and again, this is all by the grace of God, people can't do this on their own, they gave their lives and witness to Jesus Christ, so God gives them the grace that they would have received in the sacrament of baptism, because God isn't bound to the sacraments, God, that's the normal way he saves, but he's not bound to them, so nobody's condemned because of their circumstances, and also, you know, people that would have a desire for baptism, you know, maybe they just would die a natural death of illness or whatever, an accident, that would have been a baptism of a desire. They had the desire for baptism, which to God, that counts for baptism because you have that sincere desire. Now, that's not the same as somebody who knows they need to be baptized and they don't really go about doing it. And they delay and delay and delay, and then maybe they die without baptism. Well, I mean, I don't know what the ultimate destiny is. That's something God has to judge. But but for people who have that desire, but they can't for whatever reason of their circumstance, they're not condemned. So, <clears throat> so baptism makes us partakers of the divine nature and children of God by adoption because we're not born children of God. We're, we're creatures of God, but we're not children of God because we need, we don't share that divine nature because of our fallen nature. But through baptism, we become sharers in that divine nature through grace and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So this is from Second Peter. His divine power has bestowed on us everything that makes it for life and devotion through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and power. Through these, he, was, he has bestowed on us the precious and very great promises, so that through them you may come to share in the divine nature after escaping from the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. And from Galatians, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son born of a woman born under the law, to ransom those under the law so that we might receive adoption. As proof that you are children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. In growing up in a Christian culture, this might not sound that revolutionary or amazing because we hear it all the time, you know, they're a child of God, I'm a child of God. This is revolutionary. This is not known in any other religion. The Jews of the Old Testament would not call God their father. Um, and like, for example, in Islam, they consider it blasphemous to call God your father, that he's God, we're his slaves, he's our master, but he's not our father and we're not his children. And then other religions have you know, like Hinduism and have a, a view of an impersonal God. It's not a God you can know. So it's certainly not going to be a father-child relationship. So this is very 
unique to Christianity. And again, this is pure grace. Um, we can't make ourselves children of God. This is a pure gift of grace through the sacrament of baptism. And I came across this quote uh, from Father Ger Reginald Gargulagrange. I'd probably butchered his name. He was a 20th century French Dominican theologian and friar, a very renowned one. Um, and I, I love this quote. Uh, it, it's really a good one to ponder. He said, the slightest degree of sanctifying grace contained in the soul of an infant after baptism is more precious than the natural good of the entire universe. All angelic natures taken together included therein for the least degree of sanctifying grace belongs to an enormously superior order, to the order of the inner life of God. Because when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us in baptism, the Father and the Son are there too. The, the Trinity are indivisible. So where you have one person of the Trinity, you always have the other two there as well. And so we have the Holy Trinity dwelling in us. And this is something that the angels don't experience the way we do. And so this is the order of grace. This is the life of God, which is superior to the angelic nature. By nature, we're below the angels in our human nature. We're below the angels in terms of, you know, the hierarchy of things, hierarchy of being. But through grace, through baptism and the other sacraments, we're actually elevated to a higher level of existence through the participation in the life of God. And so we participate in the inner life of God. Um, another story that I came across in a homily uh, that illustrates this uh you know, the amazing gift of baptism, which we can kind of take for granted, especially if you grow up, you know, Catholic or in a Christian uh, environment, you know, kind of take it for granted. Now, this is King St. Louis the Ninth of France. He lived in the Middle Ages. He, I think he's the only canonized saint among all the kings of France. So he's sort of a, he stands out among them all. Now, the name at the bottom is Louis of Poissy. I guess that's how you say it. I, I don't know French. And that's how he would sign his name on documents. He didn't sign it King Louis. And so one time he was asked, why do you always sign your documents Louis of Poissy? Because that's the name of the church or the taint place where he was baptized. So this is what he replied. I think more of the place where I was baptized than the Reims Cathedral where I was crowned. It is a greater thing to be a child of God than to be the ruler of a kingdom. This last I shall lose at death but the other will be my passport to an everlasting glory. So he had the right perspective. He had everything in right order. He knew that baptism was way more important than being king of France because that was temporary, but baptism gave him the gift of eternal life if he, if he persevered in grace. So when we're baptized, some, some things are poured into our souls. The first are the theological virtues. These are faith, hope, and charity. And these are called theological virtues because they unite us in relationship with God. So these are the three virtues that we need to be in relationship with God. Then we have the moral virtues. Now these are not, these are the cardinal virtues. And this comes from the Latin word cardo, which means hinge. So it's not the bird. And so these four hinge virtues have a bunch of virtues under them. These are like the main categories. So there's temperance, there's fortitude, which is like moral courage, prudence, which is like wisdom, good judgment, and justice, which is giving others their due. And temperance is like moderation, moderate, you know, mod, you, know you have control of your desires. And so there's a whole lot of other virtues that are under these virtues that, and of course, now these virtues exist in the natural realm, like the pagan Roman philosophers, Greek philosophers, all recognize these virtues. These exist in the natural realm, but the virtues that we receive from baptism are supernatural. So these are the moral virtues supernaturalized. It's just like faith 
there's natural faith, you know, just there, you know, uh, a non-Christian who just believes in the existence of God, that's like a natural faith. That's not the supernatural virtue of faith that we receive in baptism. So these moral virtues that are infused into us are a level above the human natural virtues by the same name, the same virtues, but they're elevated by grace. We also receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And these are the ones I'm not going to go into detail. I'm, I'll mention them, but please read those handouts that will give you more information about those gifts. So there's the what's called the Isaiah gifts because they're mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11. And those are wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, fortitude, piety, and fear of the Lord. And these gifts all either affect, they enlighten our intellect or strengthen our will in order to be able to become holy. So these gifts, every baptized person gets, every single baptized person gets these seven gifts because these are necessary for becoming holy. But the cares, what are often called the charismatic gifts, and these are found in 1 Corinthians 12, I'm just going to mention a few of them, are the gift of intercession, miracles, prophecy, teaching, administration, service, healing, faith, evangelist. Uh, these are just some of them, and they're mentioned in that chapter. These are gifts given determined by the Holy Spirit. Not everybody gets all of these gifts. They are given to us by the Holy Spirit. He gives us the gifts he wants us to have based on what he wants us to do. And these are gifts that are to be in service to the church. They're not for so much for our sanctification, although they certainly help with that. They are to be at service of the church. So they have a different function. And again, it's not that, like not everybody's gonna have the gift of miracles, not everybody's gonna have the gift of healing or the gift of tongues or the gift of prophecy. God will give those gifts to you. He'll give you whatever gifts he wants you to have. And then it's for you to discover them and develop them and use them because that's why he gave them. He will give them just like your natural gifts. He's given you your natural gifts. And it's up to you to develop those natural gifts for whatever purpose God has for you to use them for in your life. So what are some of the rights and responsibility that come from baptism? So here's some of the rights. We have a right to Christian teaching to be nourished by God's word. We have a right to ceremonies and liturgies. We have a right to be married. Now, this is if you're you know, capable of being married, you know, if you're already married, obviously you can't get married again. Um, and you have a right to the sacraments. Again, if you are um, in, a, in a situation where you can, like, for example, if you're excommunicated, you can't receive the sacraments until you repent and get the excommunication lifted. But in a normal circumstance, you know, you have a right to be married, you have the right to the sacraments, ceremonies, liturgies. So these are all the things that baptism gives you a right to. But with rights comes responsibilities. So it's not just about rights, but we have a responsibility to publicly profess our faith. So there's no such thing as a private faith for a Catholic. We are given the mission to witness to Jesus Christ publicly and to raise our children in the faith. And that's a promise that couples make when they get married in the church is to raise their children in the faith and also to financially support the church. So those are three of the main um, responsibilities that we have as Catholics when we're baptized. Now, one question that comes up is why do we baptize infants? Um, because if you read the Bible, it doesn't explicitly mention the baptism of infants. So where does that come from? And, and I, I didn't see that when I was a Protestant. I looked at the Bible. I didn't see bap infant baptism. So I thought that was not scriptural, which is why I was Baptist before I became Presbyterian. So I'm going to just give you a brief explanation. So in the Old Testament, um, you have covenants. There are several covenants. And a covenant is a sacred binding agreement between two parties. And, and, and when we're talking in covenants in the Old Testament, one party is always God and the other one, the first covenant was with Adam, the second with Noah, 
And then there was the covenant with Abraham and then David and Moses. And then finally a covenant in Jesus. So these covenants, and I think this has been talked about before, um, you know, these advance God's plan of salvation. And God, and so the, in the old covenant with Abraham, it, okay, this is from Genesis 17. God said to Abraham, this is the covenant between me and you and your descendants after you that you must keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised circumcise the flesh of your foreskin that will be the sign of the covenant between me and you so remember we talked about signs with sacraments throughout the ages every male among you when he is eight days old shall be circumcised including houseborn slaves and those acquired with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants so this is a requirement to enter into relationship with god to have all the males even non-family members, anyone in your household who is a male has to be circumcised. And if they're an infant on the eighth day, in order to live in covenant relationship with God, and this is for your descendants as well. So fast forward to the New Testament. Peter says at Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is made to you and to your children, and to all those far off, whomever the Lord our God will call. So there's that covenant language. It's not just you repent and be baptized, but this promise is for you and your children. And so from Colossians, we learn that baptism replaces circumcision, because remember we talked about prefiguring, like Noah in the ark prefigures baptism. Uh, passing through the Red Sea prefigures baptism. So does circumcision. So it says in Colossians, in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision, not administered by hand by stripping off the carnal body with the circumcision of Christ. You were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. So this is saying that Baptism is replacing circumcision. And then if you look at these other scripture references, which are in one of your handouts, it doesn't specifically mention infants being baptized, but it mentions whole households being baptized. So it's never just like the Philippian jailer or Lydia. It says they and their households were baptized. And it can be safely assumed that there were probably children, at least under the age of reason, if they weren't infants, they were probably below the age of reason, in other words, below age seven, that would have been baptized because in the case of baptism and in the case of circumcision in the Old Testament, the children were brought into covenant relationship through the faith of the parents. And then once the child is old enough, they kind of claim their faith, you know, they make their decision to either follow the covenant their own on their own, just like with baptism, we raise our kids up, they, they're baptized typically as infants or toddlers, and then they make their first communion, and then they're confirmed, and that's kind of like that growing up in that faith of bap that is first given in baptism, and so, but the, but it's, it's a beginning for them, it's the beginning of new life that's got to be nurtured, and so they've got to pick up the baton and make it their own. So it's not a guarantee they're going to go to heaven, but it's that beginning of life in Christ so that they've, you know, got the doorway open to getting there. So that's it on baptism. So now we've got confirmation. And confirmation comes from the Latin word confirmare, which again, this word is not in the Bible and don't be disturbed by that because Latin was not a language that was the Old Testament or the New Testament was written in originally. So the word's not gonna be there, but it's there. And the short video that I'm gonna show is gonna show that where the, one of the places we can find the sacrament, even though the word isn't used. So the word confirmare means to complete, to seal, to give the fullness of the spirit. And so that's essentially what confirmation does. It completes and perfects the grace of baptism. So it, it kind of finishes and perfects what is begun with baptism. Um, 
So yeah, first I'm gonna cover this and then I'll show the um, video by Dr. Petrie. So baptism, the sign is water. With confirmation, there's two signs, oil and the laying on of hands because the bishop will make the sign of the cross on the forehead or lay the hand on there, but he'll also apply oil. Now in the Eastern Rite Catholic churches, the sign that's emphasized is the sign of oil. They do use the hand, but they emphasize the sign of oil. And that's why confirmation is not called confirmation in Eastern Rite churches or in Eastern Orthodox churches, it's called chrismation. And chrism is the Greek word for oil. The Latin Rite Church, which we're in, emphasizes the sign of laying on of hands. Oil is still used, but the sign that's emphasized more is the laying on of hands. So it's just a matter of emphasis. It's not a different understanding of the sacrament. Also, the form, which is the words that are used in the sacrament. In the Eastern Rite churches, the wording is a little, it means the same thing. It's worded differently. The bishop will say, the seal of the gift to the Holy Spirit. And in the Latin Rite church, it says, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it means the exact same thing, but it's worded just a little bit differently. All right, let's try it again. Again. <laughs> It's a window onto the early it? church, right? So we're during the Easter season. We're looking yes, yes. at what okay. Christianity looked like in the early days. We're, we're, we're going back to the birth of the church. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 8, we get a, another window onto another sacrament. In this case, the power of the sacrament we're looking at to be called the sacrament of confirmation. So I want to read this story. You might think at first glance, what does this have to do with confirmation? I'll make it clear in just a second. So this is a story of Philip, who was one of the deacons that we saw in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 6. He was one of the men who was ordained a deacon. He goes off into Samaria, which if you've been following the videos, you'll know from our study of Jesus and the Samaritan woman, was a place that was known for having um, the mixed descendants of both Israelites and Gentiles in the northern part of the Holy Land, uh, who were very much at odds with the Jewish people. The Jewish people saw them as like, you know, cut off as like apostates. They didn't have a healthy relationship. But after the, um, the coming of the spirit of Pentecost, Philip as a deacon goes to the land of Samaria in order to evangelize them, in order to bring the gospel to them. And this is what happens. Chapter eight, verse five and following says, Philip went down to a city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the multitudes with one accord gave heed to what was said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs which he did. For unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, crying with a loud voice, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. Now, if you skip down, in this case, the lectionary actually skips several verses in which Philip not only preaches, but also baptizes various men and women amongst the Samaritan. But if you skip down to the, the verse, the lectionary picks up in verse 14, it says this, Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For it had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. All right, pause there. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, why are Peter and John sent down to Samaria to lay hands on people? Um, why didn't Philip just do that? Is kind of the question behind this story. So obviously what's happening here is Philip, the deacon, is evangelizing. And he obviously has the power to preach and the power to baptize. But when it comes to this right of laying hands on the people so that they can receive the Holy Spirit, that's evidently something that only Peter and John, who were two of the apostles, could do. So they have to come all the way down from Jerusalem to get this, I'm sorry, well, it's actually up because it's north, but you get the idea. They come all the way from Jerusalem to Samaria in order to lay hands on these recent converts uh, and give them the Holy Spirit. 
Now you might be confused. You might think, well, wait a second. Don't you receive the Holy Spirit when you're baptized? I mean, it says they've been baptized. And the answer is yes, of course, you do receive the Holy Spirit in baptism. But obviously here, Luke is describing some other gift of the Holy Spirit, some other special bestowal of the Holy Spirit that only Peter and John can do, and that they do not by immersing them in water, like with baptism, but rather by laying hands on their heads. Well, what is this a reference to? If you look at the ancient church fathers, if you look at the tradition of the church, this has always been seen as the origins of what we now call the sacrament of confirmation. In the, in the West, we call it confirmation. Among Eastern Catholics and Eastern Christians, they call it chrismation, because the laying on of hands is accompanied by an anointing as well. Chrism being the word for oil, right? The Greek word for oil. Uh, so, what's going on here? Well, this is an extremely important passage, because this is basically like the first witness to the sacrament of confirmation in the early church. And it tells us a few things about this sacrament. First, number one, that it's different than baptism. It's not the same thing as baptism. Philip baptizes people, he's a deacon, but only the apostles lay hand to give the, hands to give this special gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, secondly, um, not only is it a different rite, but it's carried out by different people. Um, why is it that Philip couldn't do it? Well, if you look at the history of the church, uh, that's not the, a power that deacons have. They don't have the power to confirm. They have the power to preach, they have the power to baptize, but they don't have the power to confirm. Because that special gift of the Holy Spirit that's tied to confirmation has to do with the preaching of the gospel, uh, in a sense, the bearing witness to Christ. And so it's fitting that the apostles themselves would lay hands on the people to give them that special grace of the Holy Spirit that completes their baptism and then sends them out, in a sense, as missionaries themselves, as the ones who can go out and spread the good news in their lives through their witness and through their, uh, just through their daily life and through their conversations and their, and their witness to, to Christ. So, um, I, I love this passage because one of the sacraments that was rejected by many of the non-Catholic, of the Protestant reformers at the time of the Reformation was confirmation. It was claimed that confirmation was unbiblical. And so, so many Christian denominations don't even have confirmation anymore uh, because they don't see the word confirmation anywhere in the Bible. And it's true. If you look at the New Testament, will you find the word confirmation? No, absolutely not. But do you find the reality there? Absolutely, yes. You see it right here in Acts chapter 8. So what is confirmation? It is a special grace of the Holy Spirit that can only be given by the apostles and their successors. And it's tied to the ritual of the laying on of hands. It's different than baptism, but it's tied to baptism and it completes baptism. And it gives them this grace of the Holy Spirit to go out and bear witness themselves. Um, so confirmation kind of has its origins in Pentecost, which is where the, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and there were tongues of fire. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, Peter was preaching boldly. Remember what Dr. Petrie was saying in the video? It's kind of associated with preaching. The apostles preached the word, uh, proclaimed Jesus Christ. And um, wait, wait a minute. I skipped ahead. Sorry about that. Let's see. There's anointing in the Old Testament. The old the uh, kings of Israel were anointed by the prophets, and the Holy Spirit would come upon them. They were not filled with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And we see this like with King David. And then there is, um, let me get, and then Jesus is going back to Jesus's baptism in the Jordan River is his anointing as the Messianic King because Messiah, which is Christ in Greek, means anointed one. So he, like all the other Davidic kings before him, instead of being anointed with oil, he was baptized and the Holy Spirit member comes upon him in the form of a dove. And that is his anointing as the Messiah King and also where he sanctifies water to be used for baptism and then going, then we see Pentecost in the book of Acts. And we also see that the everybody's, they're either speaking tongues and these Jews are from all over around the Mediterranean world. They all have their own languages. 
but they hear Peter and the apostles speaking in their own languages. And they're going, what's going on? And what this is going on at Pentecost is a reversal of the judgment at Babel. And it ushers in the last days. And so if you go back to Genesis 11, you know, we see that mankind, sinful mankind and his pride, they're trying to build this tower to get up to heaven. And it's not out of love and honor of God. It's just like pride and, uh, you know, just kind of like we're going to make a name for ourselves. So then it says God scatters men. He confuses their language, which is what Babel means. And so then mankind is speaking different languages and they can't all come together like they used to. So Pentecost is the reversal of that. And this is all through the grace of the Holy Spirit. So confirmation is necessary for baptismal grace to have full effect. Um, so what does it do? It deepens our adoption because remember we're adopted in baptism. We're made children of God. It unites us more fully to Christ. So it's all just a deepening of what baptism does. It increases the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given in baptism. It perfects our relationship with the church, and it gives us a special strength to be witnesses for Christ. Because remember what he said in the video, that it was fitting that the apostles would be the ones to get this sacrament, since they were specially commissioned to preach and be witnesses. And that's what confirmation does. It it gives us that ability to be witnesses for Christ. And what St. Thomas Aquinas said was that the sacrament makes us an adult spiritually. Now, it doesn't mean that we're instantly conferred with spiritual maturity, just like because somebody is a physical adult doesn't mean they're emotionally mature. And so again, we still may be an adult spiritually. In other words, we have all the, the grace we need to mature in our faith. But we still have to cooperate with grace to become mature in our faith. The virtues that were given in baptism are perfected by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then grace perfects nature. Uh, he says, if we're taught not to expect much, then people will act on that. In other words, when you re receive a sacrament, if you don't really expect to get much out of it, you won't. And so it gets back to that disposition. And I remember very vividly when I was confirmed as an adult at Easter Vigil, before I was sort of, uh, I lived in a very anti-Catholic area and I was kind of timid about, you know, talking to people about becoming Catholic because people were pretty hostile. But after I got confirmed, I noticed I wasn't afraid anymore, and I, I had a, a much stronger boldness about sharing my faith, I, and it, I could only attribute it to the grace of confirmation. Um, now, there's different practices in giving confirmation uh, throughout the church. In the early church, and still today in the Eastern Rite Catholic churches, and in the Orthodox churches, which are not in, the Orthodox church is not in communion with the Catholic church, the Eastern Rite Catholics are in these in the early church and in the Eastern Rite and Orthodox churches, infants receive all three sacraments of initiation at once: baptism, Holy Eucharist, and confirmation. And here's a picture of a little baby getting in it as a baby. Um, but this doesn't happen in the Western, the Latin Rite. And the reason why is originally the practice was the same, but in the Middle Ages. As the church grew and became more populated, uh, the bishop, it wasn't easy for the bishop to be available for confirmation, I mean, to do baptism and confirmation and Eucharist all together. And in the West, they decided they wanted to keep confirmation associated with the bishop since the bishop had the fullness of fo holy orders, uh, you know, their, their successors, the apostles. So in the Middle Ages, they separated confirmation from the other two uh, sacraments of initiation. And so they were given at a later time. Now, there's different times when this is given in the Latin church, and it allows three different ages. Infancy is permitted at infancy along with baptism. It's Although I don't think this is very common. Uh, the age of reason, which is with First Holy Communion, which is more bishops are 
doing this. I know the diocese I used to live in in Tyler, initially confirmation was given in eighth grade, and then they moved it down to the age of reason with Holy Communion. The other one is adolescence, like they do in the Diocese of Galveston, Houston, which is junior high, high school age, anywhere between eighth and 11th grade, and of course, adults. And each bishop sets the age of confirmation in his own diocese. So this uh, is just up to the bishop to decide when he thinks is the best age to allow confirmation. And again, uh, you know, we have a, an adult confirmation program because some people that are baptized Catholic, they don't get confirmation. That was my case. I was baptized Catholic, but I didn't get any other sacraments when I was growing up. So I got confirmation and Eucharist as an adult. So, I mean, you can get confirmed at any age. And I sponsored a lady two or three years ago who got confirmed at the age of 75. So you're never too old to get confirmed. Um, and I think that was the last one, actually. Yep, that's it. Hey, Joan, this is Rick. We have a question, Doreen and I. You know, you mentioned in your uh, teaching about there was no Latin in the scriptures. So why are we doing Latin, you know, singing in Latin and Latin masses? That's a very good question because what happened is the you know the Rome is the seat of you know the the Bishop of Rome is the Pope who's the visible head of the church so that's the focal point of the church and after uh, Latin became the common language uh, eventually uh, after uh, you know with the Roman Empire Latin was widely spoken and in the, especially in the West, and Greek was spoken more predominantly in the East. And so as Rome uh, took over, because remember there was a collapse of the Roman Empire in the early fifth century, and the Greek in the East was kind of more predominant. Uh, you know, there was more influence of the Greek, the Eastern church, because it was civilized. Whereas after Rome, the Roman Empire collapsed in the West, there was no government, the civilization collapsed, it was, you know, kind of chaotic. But over time, the West became, grew in power and influence. And the Pope, of course, was the most powerful figure in the church and Latin was the language. And so eventually Latin replaced Greek as the common language. And that's why when Jerome was commissioned to translate the Bible into Latin, it was called the Vulgate, which is still the official translation of the church. And Vulgate means common because Latin was the common language of the people. So it actually wasn't a foreign language for the early church. And so Latin remained the liturgical language in the West. And so, and it remained that until Vatican II, which Vatican II still said Latin should be used, but it was abandoned largely, which it shouldn't have been. But yeah, Latin is, and of course the Latin that's used in the church is a church Latin, it's not classical Latin. Uh, so it's, you know, the pronunciation's a little different, but yeah, so that has to do with the life of the church. But the actual scriptures were written in Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek because at the time of Christ, Greek was the common language of the people. And that had to do with Alexander the Great centuries before conquering that area and making an empire and introducing Greek culture and language. And so Greek was the common language. And so, uh, but then over time, Latin took precedence over Greek. So. Do you want to It still is the official language in the documents of the church. Yeah. And, and it could be related, this is a question that Jesus Christ, when he, when he was crucified, Pontius Pilate or orders the inscription on the cross in three languages, mm -hmm. which is Latin, Greek, and Aramaic, uh, Hebrew. So that could be any, probably a, foreshadow of what the church was going to be 
least that, that's could be. Me. Yeah, it could be. Because I think Father Rick said during one of his talks, I always wondered why they had the Kyrie in, in Mass. You know, why do we have this Greek word in the middle of Mass, you know? And I remember he said that the church kept that to show the tie, because originally the liturgy was in Greek when Greek was the predominant language. And he said the church kept the Kyrie in there to, to tie back to the early church which used Greek predominantly. And then these other Eastern rites have their own liturgical languages. The Maronites have Aramaic, which is the language Jesus spoke. And other rites have other languages that, you know, like Slavonic and things like in the, I think it's Ruthenian. And then there's all kinds of other rites that have their own languages. Uh, so the Latin rite is the biggest rite, um, but that's why we're most, familiar with Latin because it's the biggest right and when the one we live in where it's predominant so 